everybody and hello especially Tia. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's my first year at Slush and first time as a speaker. I'm very honored to be here. We're super happy to have you here. Um, we're talking about maximizing investor relationship here today, and it's for sure a necessary foundation for any founder for both raising VC and also keeping a strong relationship with your investors. Um, you've been investing in startups for 10 years already, first focusing on series A and B, and now also uh, investing in seed stage. Um, looking at your extensive background in early stage VC, how should you uh, advise founders to start uh, building their investor relationships? When you start from scratch, it's a, I think it's a hustle. But uh, I also think that uh, as a founder and, uh, and CEO, especially like your key job is basically to hire and fundraise. So it's kind of the hustle you should enjoy. When I think about my own background, uh, 10 years ago, I was working at a McKinsey in a very corporate environment. I didn't know anyone in startups. I don't think I even knew what VC was at the time. And so I was interested in tech, and so the, the way I did it was to um, uh, join a coding school. The coding school was uh, inside an incubator, and so there there was a lot of founders hanging and, uh, and VCs, and so, so that's how I, I got into it. Um, I think, yeah, this event is a typically good place. I know lots of great, good stories with volunteers and buddies having uh, uh, met uh, investors and, uh, at Slush. So. Uh, well done to all the, the volunteers who are here. Um, with regards to when you start thinking about fundraising, I think there are really two ways to, to build the relationships. The best is really the, the warm uh, intro over the, the cold email. When I uh, look back at all the companies I've invested in, uh, I think most of the founders I've met were through um, uh, either intros from other investors, so either later stage investors. So, for example, today I will talk to the Axel team. They will tell me, uh, we met these founders, they're great, but uh, it's a bit too early for me, so send them to me. Or Business Angel. Uh, or also another really good type of introduction is uh, other founder. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, last year I invested in a company called uh, Ambar in the UK, which was founded by a, a, a founder called Luis, uh, who's from Chile. I don't think I really had any connections in common with him, uh, but he had worked at a startup called Lendable in the UK, which is a successful fintech, which was founded by a, uh, a friend of mine. And so she thought he was great. And when he started his company, she introduced him to me. And I think it's really the best way to, to get to know him because of the recommendation and also this great reference uh, that he had, which really played a, a big part into making the decision to, to invest. Yeah. What about, do you have, like, recommend using any tracking to like, basically stay on top of all of your VC discussions, especially at the early stage? Yeah, I think once you enter a game, you'll see there's so many investors, and it will switch from like, looking to talk to investors to like, investors basically uh, starting to reaching out to you. And like, I'm very, like, when I talk to my founders, I ask them, like, how many emails a week you receive from, from investors? And like, often it can be like 50. Um, so at one point, I think... Uh, you can have your, your, your CRM to, to deal with the VCs. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, then especially in the early stage, of course, discussing with investors can be overwhelming. Um, what would you say are the most common mistakes when talking to VCs? Um, one of them I see, I see quite often is at very, very early stage, uh, when you're at pre-seed or seed, is um, uh, going through an intermediary, so either like a a banker or like a, a, a professional fundraiser. That happens especially uh, in France where, where, where I'm based. And even if there are some great bankers and like they've held founders, I think at the very, very early stage, um, as a founder and the CEO, I think, you know, as VC, we think that it's really a key part of your job to fundraise. And like part of the decision is, well, if I invest now, will this, this is, will this person be able to raise the next round, the Series A, the Series B? And so for me, it's not a red flag, but I would say an orange flag when I see a founder at the very early stage not coming in uh, alone to, to fundraise. So that's one of them. Another, I think, is uh, um, really only wanting to talk to partners at VC funds and check writers and underestimating the, the more junior people, the associates. I think the associates are the people who are often you know, very hungry, uh, really do the work inside to push the deal. I think in big firms like uh, 
Axel Index, where you have a lot of partners, often it's good to uh, also find like a, uh, a junior person who can really be your ambassador and also help uh, guide you through the firm. And so uh, I always uh, recommend uh, uh, founders to, uh, uh, to, uh, to find someone in the junior or mid-level team to, uh, to, to talk to. And uh, last one, it's, I would say it's always um, being overly candid. I think um, fundraising is a bit of a, uh, I think if you're good, you're going to be able to raise money. But in order to raise the best amount with the best people, you kind of have to play a game. And so sometimes some common mistakes I see is, for example, founders being very open, telling a VC, oh, I'm talking to this person, this person, this person, giving names. And then the VCs call each other. And then you create the dynamic where, where um, that can like, um, uh, impact, uh, have a negative impact on the momentum of the round. Or basically, they say, oh, I'm going to close in two weeks. The reality is often it takes much more time. And, uh, and so if you say your target is to close in two weeks and then you don't meet the target, uh, the VCs will think, oh, it's taking longer than expected. Maybe there's something wrong. And there's not something wrong. But um, it, uh, it, uh, like it creates like a, a bad signal. So uh, try to, yeah, early on, find someone to, to help you play the, the VC and the fundraising uh, game. Yeah, that's a very good tip uh, on the timing as well. Um, of course, we know that the economy has been now shifting between bull and bear, mark bear markets in the past few years, and obviously VC is not immune to these changes, even though it might react a bit differently to the public markets. Mm, how would you say the market conditions change the uh, VC relationships with founders? Um, interesting. So I started 10 years ago, so in 2015, so I feel like the first phase of my career based in London was a 15, 20, 21 kind of a bull market going up. Then there was a, a kind of a explosion, the bear market. Now I feel like we're in a market which is like bull and bear, like super bull on AI, quite bear on a lot of other things. Um, that definitely has an impact on the founder VC relationship. I think it changes the, uh, the power shift in bull markets, like founders have more power. In bear markets, VC sometimes can have a bit more power. I think the best founders, like if you're part of the top one or 10%, you always have the power. Money will always be a commodity, but it still can have an impact on the dynamics. And for me, the most important is whether it's a bull or bear market, never to abuse your power. So for example, if you're a founder in a bull market, you're a repeat founder, you want, you're launching a new company, you're going to be able to raise whatever amount you want to raise. You choose 5, 10, 20. Um, and I think that can be, you know, sometimes dangerous. And um, uh, I've seen now more, like uh, in the current markets, like the two, uh, the two last repeat uh, entrepreneurs that I backed who are one guy called Ludovic who had already sold a dating app and now is doing a new one. And another guy called Henry who had done a grocery um, app and now is build, building a SaaS business. Both of them could have raised any amount and they chose to raise between like three and five million uh, instead of like 10, which they were being offered. And I think uh, in this case, basically, they, they didn't you know, use all their power and they tried to be more reasonable and that was good. And on the other side, I think the VCs uh, should always be very careful, for example, with, uh, with terms like harsh terms in term sheets can create a misalignment, which is never good in the, in the long term. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Then, of course, another thing as a founder you need to deal with when ra raising is, of course, rejection. Um, what, do you, what would you say are, is the best way to deal with rejection, uh, even when you have a great product at your hands? I mean, I think rejection is really <laughs> a non-issue for me. Like, uh, the best founders get rejected, like, many times. Uh, as VCs ourselves, by the way, we raise money, we get rejected the whole time. Um, I... Um, uh, it's our job also, like, I think we reject, uh, I, we reject like, between 90 and 99% of the, the companies we meet. I think no doesn't mean no to the, to the founder. It's like no at this time on this project. And uh, it should be, never be taken uh, uh, really personally. Uh, the advice I give to the founders I work with is to try to get the, maybe the feedback out of every rejection. Sometimes there's like, a, something to improve in the pitch. Uh, there is uh, something to change in the amount uh, 
uh, that you're pitching to fundraise. There's um, little things and um, and uh, yeah, and move on. Yeah. What are some, uh, let's say, common household names for like, companies who have actually faced a lot of rejection before they managed to raise money? And some, some of the well-known stories, I guess, are yeah, Uber, Airbnb. But uh, yeah, a couple of days ago, I was listening, for example, to, to Reshma, the founder of Seedcamp, on stage. And she was telling the UiPath story. And uh, at the time, like when Seedcamp invested, from what I understood, uh, UiPath had been uh, rejected by n nearly all the, all the traditional VCs, all the tier one brands, everyone, and Seedcamp was one of the very uh, rare investors to, to, to make the bet at the time, and it was a great bet because I think UiPath is one of the yeah, biggest, if not biggest, exit of the last few years in, the, in Europe. Yeah, definitely. The timing for VCs plays a role, and like, don't give up if you get rejected a bunch of times. Uh, you might still have an excellent thing on your hands. Um, then something that uh, I've also found interesting from your background is your perspective of um, raising money from European versus uh, US investors. Um, and of course, especially as we are here in Europe, uh, this is a very common topic in the startup ecosystem regardless. So when, when do you think it makes more sense to raise money from the US compared to Europe? Mm. So I think the question is like, um, is your market at one point going to be uh, the US? And if the answer is yes, you should definitely uh, raise money from the US. I have a bit of a bias because I've been based between London and Paris. And so often I try to convince founders at seed stage that it's good to have a, a local uh, investor on the, on the cap table. Uh, if part of your team and often like when like uh, I invest in teams where like you have like the technical team based in Europe and then the go to market team goes to the US. And so a setup that I've seen working well a, a few times now is uh, having a, a, lead, uh, uh, a lead at seed uh, that has a footprint in uh, Europe and then completing the cap tables with a lot of like US angels. Uh, so for example, that's what we did in, with a company called Lago, which is actually a YC company, but uh, moved back to France. Uh, co-founding like the CTO Rafi and the technical team is in France, the CEO decided to move Anto to, to SF. And so she has a, you know, like a, a mix of both. And then at the Series A, um, I think uh, global platforms are great. So she raised with Firstmark, so she, for, you, you, American fund, but a uh, uh, European partner. So I think she has a, the best of, uh, of, uh, of both, both worlds. Yeah, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Then moving on from raising to actually maintaining good relationships between investors, um, what do you think is the right balance between nurturing your current investor relations and then, of course, talking to new investors for the coming funding rounds? So after you fundraised, yeah. um, I think the key is to focus on building your business. <laughs> uh, otherwise, yes, nurturing the existing investors there. I think there's a difference between the lead investors and the, the follow-on investors. I think it's very important actually to have that discussion before you sign the term sheet and before you take on the money of like what you want that relationship to, good li to look like. And that can be very different depending on your own profile, if you're a first-time founder, repeat founder, or the sector. Uh, and then uh, regularly check in with your lead investor. So like, are we going to meet weekly, uh, twice a month, every month? Um, the monthly reporting, like uh, what is it going to to look like, and like make sure that you're always aligned also on like on that. And for the, I would, the what I call the, like the long tail of investors, so let's say you have 10, 20 business angels, I think uh, uh, it's good to engage with them uh, too. Uh, what I've seen work well is often quarterly updates for the the long tail of investors, and then of course knowing. Uh, having had that discussion when the, the business angel invests, of like how do you like to work with your angel investments? Some business angels like have hundreds of uh, investment in the cap table. They will tell you, I'm never going to reach out to you. So if you need something, you better text me on, on like on this number. Other ones will be more proactive. So it's really a, it's really a, yeah a, a case by case thing. Yeah, then how about when you're not actively fundraising, like how many intros or new investor discussions would you still have on a weekly basis? Yeah. A good rule of thumb that I like, that was advice that was given by um, Nicola Julia, the founder of Sora, who always had like a lot of inbound for investors. He was like, I keep one hour in my calendar uh, every week to meet a new one or two new investors, whether it's like a two 30 minutes call or a one hour meeting, uh, even when I'm not fundraising. 
a saying that said that the best time to fundraise is when you don't need to fundraise. And I think, uh, like, if you are, of course, if you think that there's a chance that you might need to fundraise again one day, that's a, that's a, that's that works pretty well. Yeah, that's that's a very good practical advice as well. Um, then another topic of, of course, maintaining good relationship with your investors is managing tough times. Um, how should a founder approach any challenging discussions with their investor to make sure that the relationship still stays good uh, regardless? Um, first, I think where if there's tough time in the business, should never be like an excuse to have like a bad relationship with your investor, especially the earliest stage investors who are really meant to be in the in the in the same uh, same same boat as you. Um, uh, I mean, it's very cliche what I'm saying, but I think communication is important. Um, I've had a situation actually, like uh, like recently, where uh, I've had a founder like sit down with me and like telling me like, I, give me like proper feedback and harsh feedback like the other way around. Often it's like you think the VC only gives like uh, feedback or harsh feedback to founders, but I think it can work both ways. And in those cases, being able to to sit down in in, in person can solve a, a lot of things. Yeah. And actually continuing on the topic of difficult discussions, obviously it can take up to a few years before even a good startup fully takes off and there can be many years of hardships uh, in between. How would you advise managing the relationship between, like, like during these lows, like how used to our is the tough times, for example? Um, I think it's good investors should really be like good at... Uh, managing the hard times. I think it's really our job. I think a lot of the successful businesses have gone through hard times, have pivoted. There's just so many stories. Uh, I think a good tip is like when you when you do the references for the VCs you choose is to uh, ask for re um, references from of course founders where, the, where it's going well, but also ask for a couple of references for, with founders where like the company went bankrupt or things didn't go so well. And I think that's a good way to like uh, see the, 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 the character of the of the of the investor uh, you work with, that's another bias on me. I think that's also why it's good to have a few people in the cap table who are like specialized early stage investors because I think they will always really be on your your side uh, uh, even if they're tough times. And investors who are used to the whole phase, which is pre-product market fit, well, yeah, sometimes can have like six months, nine months, twelve months of like nothing happening. Yeah. What do you think about, like, should the founders ever hide that they're having a difficult time uh, building a company? No, yeah, no, that's also a pattern. Where we noticed I was having the conversation earlier with uh, uh, Roxanne, who was on stage, who was also an investor in many companies, and we were both noticing that, you know, we start noticing that things go wrong when we stop receiving the monthly, the monthly update. Um, and that's, yeah, an easy trap uh, is to to. to to like pause the investor updates when you think things are going wrong, and I think, yeah, that's uh, that's never never a good idea. Yeah, that's that's a good good note as well. Um, continuing with the topic of sharing information to your investors, um, what kind of concrete advice do you have on reporting, and what kind of things should you then uh, share to investors? Like you might mentioned those updates al already earlier at the beginning of the talk. Um, so I think you have to distinguish what you share in the reporting with your lead, a core group of like key investors, where I think that should be quite detailed and really like transparent in terms of what's going well, what's not going well, the KPIs, the metrics, and then what you share to like the longer tail of investors or like external investors, where of course you should always like say the truth of what's going on, but you should also assume that's what not shares with the first circle like is gonna be like you know, shared to the broader market. So a mistake that I see sometimes is like, for example, founders who are over optimistic and who say pre-product market fit, like I think at the end of the year, I'm gonna be at three million in AR, or like I'm gonna be there. And so it's written in like many updates, it's shared everywhere. But then, you know, for different reasons, they don't meet it at this time. And so that creates, um, you know, that can create like a, uh, discussions between people in the market saying, oh, this company is behind, when the reality is it's not, because you just don't know how long it's going to take at the beginning. And so, yeah, I would always keep in mind that, you know, when, I'm a, when you're a founder, is like what you 
that what you, you put out there is also what people are going to share uh, between uh, each other. Yeah, good to keep in mind. Then uh, let's move on next to a topic uh, like fun composition and all that kind of stuff. Um, what does the ideal round composition look like in your opinion, like the split between VC, angels, etc.? Um, so I precede, or, or, or so I think precede, and we see now more and more, and I think it's good, like pure angel rounds, like like small amounts at seed stage, which is a stage I've been focusing on the last four years or rounds between. But now that the seeds can be like, especially with AI, can be. But let's say a non-AI deal, like seeds are like one to like five million rounds. I think the ideal setup is like a um, one lead. And I've tried the model where we have two co-leads. I think that's really a personal opinion that um, it's better to have like one person really like with skin in the game and accountable rather than two VCs who who are like a, yeah co-leads co in the round. Um, and then uh, have a, a few micro, micro like uh, super angel funds. Uh, I think we have more and more very good ones in Europe. I think that's something that's really changed in the past uh, few years. Like for example, you have uh, you know, Gloria Borland, who was at Index before, who started like a fund called Puzzle Ventures. So she does B2B tickets 200K. You have Moti in France. Uh, you have um, uh, Purple. Like all of those like super angel funds uh, are, are really good. And then find key angels like specialize in your sector. Uh, so for example, uh, and that's where often like in B2B, I try to, to help the founders raise with um, US uh, angel investors. Yeah, and what then should you actually take into consideration when uh, choosing the um, lead investor? As already you mentioned, you uh, prefer the model where there's only one lead uh, instead of, for example, two. I think for the VC model to work, often it depends on the fund models, but uh, often the VCs like, have f like funds which are like a certain size, and so in order to make money, they need to have like let's say between 10 and 15, 10 and 20 percent of a company. In today's world, like as a founder, and I think like you don't want to dilute too much. So in general, you want to dilute like yeah, let's say between 15 and 25 percent. So if you put like two VCs uh, who want to as co-leads with the same amount, often it means like both of them are going to have a ownership like below what they need. So they're going to be like a bit, you know, frustrated. And also if it's if it's going really well, it's going really well. But if it's taking more time or not going as well, I've seen dynamics where like, because there's no clear lead, like no one, like there's not one person like really doing as much work. Um, and so I think, uh, um, yeah, so I think that's why, uh, that's why, I, that's why I, I recommend that. But it's really with a strong bias, so. Yeah, of course, each case is uh, unique to its own, own situation. but. Uh, something interesting that also I think you might have insight about is um, having a bunch of investors, like of course, like this, let's say, building something that requires a lot of capital investment at the beginning uh, might require you to raise funding from various different VCs. Uh, for example, Ms. Charles is one of these examples. Um, how does the number of investors affect the uh, relationship building with VCs and how to still make sure that you have a strong connection with everybody? I think yeah, the best person to answer that question in this case would be like Arthur from Mistral. But yeah, now that what they very so Mistral I think raised three rounds now. Very of course very very capital intensive. I think at this stage they have maybe four or five big leads, people who are like you know have like a lot of capital, and then the choice that they made was to get like a a very very long tail of like smaller investors who could be like strategic partners and making sure, for example, because they're a B2B company that they have few key families, a few key businesses in Germany, same in France, same in Italy. Um, I think uh, actually what they do very well, I think, and also because Mistral, I think really is a company that has a lot of interest right now. Uh, like I'm being pinged, I think, by journalists like three times a week who are trying to find out the revenue, like a uh, what's the strategy? Are they going to be acquired? Like there's so many rumors uh, that they really, I think, built. They have a, a tight network of like the lead investors who they yeah share the information with, and otherwise like really super confidential for the longer tail of investors. They send like updates, but which without any numbers, and they and they ask for help. Yeah. 
That's very interesting to hear. And then uh, to wrap up, actually, something that I'd like to ask from you. We always want to uh, give some hands on practical advice also from the Builder Stage Talks. So now it's already day two of Slush. Um, what would you give us a concrete piece of advice to still maximize the time here at Slush to then start building th those investor relations or uh, nurture any current ones already? Mm. Yeah, I think Slush is great because it's super well attended. Um, the way I the way I do it is uh, try to have a mix of like being prepared, so check who's there and try to organize a few meetings. But actually, most of my time, I think 70, 80 percent of my time, I leave for serendipity. I think everyone's super open here, and you you can really meet uh, meet people uh, easily. Um, like I have an anecdote. Like last year, I was here. Like I. I was lucky to like meet, but like, just for two minutes, I met uh, Claire Hugh Johnson, who was the former CEO of Stripe, who I think was a speaker uh, last year. And I had just a small conversation with her. We exchanged numbers. That was it. And a few months later, I had like a situation where like I needed advice from like a powerful woman. So I so I'll reach out to her. And I reached out to her, and she actually answered. She remembered like our discussion at Slush. And she, since then, like, has become one of my key advisors, like joined, uh, is joining my next project as an advisor. And it's really, really, it's, I would have never met her outside of Slush. I was really serendipity. And I think that's uh, really something special uh, with what's happening at Slush. Yeah, for sure. You never know who you can meet here. Uh, we have uh, more than one investor uh, fund for each startup here at Slush. So keep your eyes open, uh, even during the after party corridors, wherever you don't know who you might meet. But uh, that's the end of our panel here. Uh, thank you, Mia, so much for sharing your insights. And uh, hope you have a great thank you. Uh, remaining slush. Thank you.